Two circuit breakers, one is faulty. The faulty one was sent in by Craig and it was used in a video arcade, I think, and it tended to trip a lot when it was turned on and not really latch. And then one day it just failed completely. And you can see sort of sooty skid marks out the side here. For comparison, this is a normal circuit breaker that goes in a similar board. And the idea is that this one has more protection because this one, well, this is one's called just an MCB, miniature circuit breaker. This one's actually called an RCBO. And I'm not sure why, because the function it has is overload, plus also it's got the earth leakage detection, you know, it's got the ground fault interrupter RCD type effect. Why didn't they call it an RCD with overload, RCDO? But they called it an RCBO, residual current breaker with overload. And it combines the function, it goes in the place of an existing single breaker, and it doesn't just do overload. Uh, in this case, it's a type C 40 amp, but it also has a 30 milliamp instant trip current if, if there's a fault. While I've got this circuit breaker here, can I show you this little device here? If you're still in the dark ages and you're turning circuit breakers off on a distribution board and putting a bit of sticky tape over them to stop people turning them on, you may want to invest in one of these. There's various different types for different types of breakers, but the idea is that if you look at your circuit breaker, there's a couple of holes here. And if you squeeze this one together, put it in and then close this catch down and put a padlock through it that you have the key to. Nobody can open that. The only way they're going to get this off is with brute force and that may actually happen. But you can use it to lock uh, the breaker off or you can actually also use it to lock the breaker on. And if you do that, if there's a fault condition, the breaker can still trip internally. It's not going to like create the situation it can't go off. But the idea of these is basically to stop you uh, being electrocuted when someone turns power on to something you were working on. So uh, always a good idea. That's in the lockout, tagout sort of zone of things. So this circuit breaker, I think we should open it. Uh, and to open it, it's got aluminium rivets. Which I'm going to drill out. And this is where sometimes these rivets just spin. That didn't spin, that's good. Let's see if I can drill my hand on camera. The tripping when it's turned on thing, isn't that uncommon? I wonder what the load was on it. Because uh, if you have very high inductive loads, the inrush current when you turn them on can cause false tripping the breakers. And this is a type C breaker, so it should be resilient to that, but it depends on what load there was. Video games, if it was video games, have two uh, factors that could cause rogue tripping that, that cause high inrush current. One of them is the fact that often the traditional old video games had um, transformers in them. Are these pins all riveted? Yep, the rivets are out. Had transformers in them, and the transformers, when they initially magnetise, they, they tend to take a bit of a bang of current, particularly if they're turned on, not quite on the sine wave, which you can't really do without electronics. Another thing in old video games that causes problems is... This is not opening, is it? is the uh, degaussing coils around the monitor. When you turn the machine on, you often hear a loud sort of bung noise from the uh, video game. And that is, looking for my schnips here, that is a coil, uh, a very high current coil around the video monitor. And when you turn the game on, it initially just powers up that coil with a temperature-dependent dependent resistor and sears it. And the current uh, flow initially through that coil is very high and it creates a strong magnetic field. And then as the temperature sensitive uh, switching device heats up, it reduces the current through it. And what that results in, you get a sort of mains AC waveform. The magnetic field alternates between north and south polarity, but it gradually reduces and it leaves a net field of virtually zero magnetic field on the monitor. And both those things do cause problems. I've had problems in the past with a, in a bingo hall actually, with a, loads and loads of monitors around it. And the breaker would have been absolutely fine if it hadn't been for these monitors. I had a problem, I had to divide it into two circuits. Uh, that rivet ain't coming out, let's use force. That's still not really looking like it's coming out. That's going to be better. And let's get this uh, thing off as well here. 
Yeah, something like that. Righty ho. Let's see if we can get any further in this time. Oh, this is looking promising. This is looking very promising. Or is it going to do it? Last time it kind of stuck at this bit here. Oh, I'll tell you what. I have a sneaky feeling. This plate comes off here. It looks like it's been clipped on the front. Let's just use unreasonable force altogether because that's uh, going to get the results we want. Oh, that is quite sooty around that. Oh, 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 that's not happy, is it? This is immediately making me think of... Oh, that is smoked inside. Oh, that's dramatic. That's much worse than I was expecting. Let's uh, get in closer to this. Let's take off the exposure a little bit to brighten it because uh, this is... Cursed in shade, it's very black. Uh, I wonder what's happened here. Mmm, very intriguing. Something really has blown up. The circuit board and everything is just like plated here. That wire is physically blown off, suggesting that's maybe been quite a bit of. Oh, and that wire's just dropped off as well. It almost looks like the circuitry has uh, been. Part of this incident. This is making me think of a John Ward video. Hello, JW here. Uh, where he had a similar situation and the circuitry was absolutely obliterated. Oh dear. Right. Uh, I'm just going to cut this module out. So here's the sensing circuit, which looks almost glued in, in a way. Yeah, John, uh, John Ward also took one apart and it had blown up inside as well. That's not so great. Um, and initially I thought, well, maybe uh, the test resistor has failed in it. Because uh, when you, if you wire these in the wrong way around, uh, when, when you press the test button, there's a little coil here, and normally it measures the live current flowing through and then the return current flowing back the way again. So in this case, it's got this, uh, the neutral wire here is coming through that coil and going out to a terminal. Where's that going? It will be ultimately leading down to the output. So it will be sneaking out to the other end of the circuit breaker. Um, the... Live then also, that was the sort of stub of red wire I just pulled out there. The live also goes through this coil and it compares the current flowing through the live and going back through the neutral. And if there's any difference, it knows that it's sneaked away. It's found its way somewhere it shouldn't have. And if that happens, it will trigger the thing to trip. And it usually does that, but this coil here has a wee plunger here, which is a... Uh, which isn't very plungery. And it should trip the mechanism out. But um, when you press the test button in the front of this, oh, you know what? A couple of things here I'm thinking now. If the coil doesn't trip, it will remain powered. Some of the circuitry in these just latches the coil and expects it to fire that uh, trip mechanism. If that's not fired, it may have actually cooked the coil. It may have drawn too much current. Uh, the other option is that uh, if you press the test button, there's a resistor that bypasses this, but it, the resistor has to pass about 30 milliamps. It has to pass more than 30 milliamps at the mains uh, voltage. So that would be uh, this, uh, li this little transistor here that is split and all the pins or thyristor possibly is possibly a clue what's happened here. Uh, that's suggesting the coil didn't uh, break the circuit. Uh, so 240 times 0 0.03, 30 milliamps, it means the resistor would dissipate 10 watts, or almost 10 watts, if it was had a margin of current to make sure that tripped. So I'm thinking, I'm just going to pan back out here because, uh, well, move along, Abdi, there's not much left to see. It is absolutely cremated. But uh, what can happen is if you push the test button, what should happen is that it should break the circuit. You have to wire these in the correct way round. If you don't wire them in the right way round, the, then the circuitry can remain powered even when the 
breakers tripped. And if you're pushing the button in, that little resistor in there could get very hot until it fails and it could cause a bit of an avalanche effect and it would then be on the input circuitry side. Um, I'm going to have to explore this. I'm going to be back in a moment. I'm just going to take a look at this. Okay, some more investigation has been done and uh, let's check down in my focus here. Yes, I am focused here. Uh, I found the data sheet for the chip that's on this. I've given it clean up. It looks now as if the fault has started with a welded contact. This uh, breaker has possibly been closed into a fault and the massive current spike has uh, welded the contact. Either that or it's been closed into, well, it, maybe it's been closed into fault too many times and it's uh, <clears throat> basically ended up just sticking together. And uh, I wonder if I can actually prize that apart. Hold on, let's, uh, I'll, I'll look at this afterwards. Let's look at the data sheet first. <clears throat> Excuse me, croaky, croaky voice. It's just like this year, I don't normally get colds, but this year it's just been continuous. It must be the really weird weather we're getting. So this is a, a dedicated ground fault interrupter or residual current device uh, integrated circuit. And it's designed to simplify all the circuitry. And if you look at the module inside, I'll zoom down on this so you can actually see this. It has all the, the circuitry required. It's got this sort of... Incoming supply, it's got a shunt regulator, it's got the, so all you need to do to provide this power is basically put a resistor in series the line to actually, to this unit. And uh, it operates a very low current and it generates its own internal voltages. It's got some sense uh, inputs for, on a, op amps to detect the uh, sense coil. <clears throat> and once uh, the correct conditions of a fault are detected, uh, it triggers this delay timer, which is an external capacitor that sets delay. That's probably what they use for uh, making the less sensitive the ones that give a slight delay to allow ones downstream to clear. But if it, uh, the fault continues, it then triggers this thyristor, sorry, this output, uh, which fires a thyristor. And if you look at the circuitry, and this is what really went bang, I think, but it was a, a symptom. It, it was caused by the other fault. Uh, let me just uh, zoom out here a wee bit. As I shuffle through all this paperwork, I should have been more organised. Okay, let's uh, zoom down this bit. This is a bit we want to see. So uh, here is the circuit, including, I was suspicious that maybe that uh, test resistor. When you push the button, uh, this button here, it shunts a resistor, which uh, bypasses some of the current from one side of the sense coils to the other, and that's what causes the um, imbalance. It, when you press the button on a RCD or GFI, it does actually do a proper electrical test. It's not a mechanical trip. It is testing all the circuitry inside. So um, <clears throat> that, from what I can see, may be intact. I don't know exactly where that is because there are all the wires have just popped off the circuit board, and it's very hard to see what's left there just because the sootiness... But uh, when this unit uh, fires a signal out of pin 7 to the gate of this thyristor, there's a, another tiny delay. They've got a tiny capacitor here just across that to prevent false triggering of the thyr thyristor. But when it does trigger, the thyristor will latch on for that half of the sine wave. Uh, and its current's going through the solenoid, through the thyristor, and then to through this link here up to the other leg of the supply. So that solenoid, this little cremated solenoid here, does get switched in by this little th thyristor, which has been blown completely off the board. And that kind of points at what may have happened there. So my guess is that if we uh, pan out a bit again here, I think the sequence of events of failure has been this contact has welded. Now, this is quite dark. I'm going to zoom in. I'm going to brighten the picture up. And you can see that this contact here is not supposed to be welded shut. That's why the whole switch was jammed. I don't know if I'm going to get this apart by just prizing it. It's kind of spot welded, that's it, apart. It really is splattered. So because the uh, because that had welded shut, let's nudge out a tiny little bit. And it must have been quite a power anomaly in the process, particularly if it went to earth somewhere. Uh, this circuit has tried to trigger and it does rely on the fact that once it's triggered, it punches that little solenoid in, it should disconnect, it should cause this to trip, and that should kill the power to this module. But in this instance, the power has remained on, uh, partly, I'm guessing, largely because that contact was welded. 
and then it's caused catastrophic failure of the, failure of the circuit because the uh, the little solenoid plunger here, I'm guessing that's a plunger, it's not moving at all. Yeah, it's, it's completely... It's completely wrecked. Yeah, it's, the whole thing is kind of melted. And uh, this cable that was lying across that has been burnt as well. So, uh, yeah, I think that's what's happened. It's been initially under a high fault condition, this contact is welded, and then it's caused the circuitry to explode. I suppose ultimately because this has failed already that something's going to give. The next thing to break would be the whatever was upstream, um, unless it actually blew the fault clear that was at connected to this, but that wouldn't protect this because the, con the current would continue flowing through it. So it's an odd scenario, it's an odd situation. And I'm pretty sure this might be the same brand that uh, the JW took apart, John Ward, and his had blown up in a similar way inside. So maybe it's a, a just a common failure mode that under extreme fault conditions where the contacts weld, the electronics then sort of explode and finish the job. Kind of interesting, also kind of sooty, but uh, the Reference, if you want to look up that uh, integrated circuit, incidentally, this is going to flare out completely, is RV4141A. That's the chip that does that if you want to investigate it and see what the circuitry is like. In a way, I know it's more versatile. It's also got the things for detecting. It uses this external connection for a ground, and it's got ways to detect a neutral to ground fault. Although, to be honest, if you get a neutral to ground fault, usually enough of the neutral current flows through the ground, it kind of splits both way, ways at the appliance to cause the neutral to trip as a fault anyway, but um, they've added that in, it's got that facility on that uh, integrated circuit to do that, but keep in mind that the Thomson unit I looked at was ultra simple, all that it had was a sense coil, basically a diode or a resistor and a thigh resistor and that was it, it was ultra simple compared to this, I wonder which is the, would be the better in the long run. But uh, yeah, interesting to see what happens when things go horribly wrong.